you ask any of us a satsang, what kind of meditation we do, including Ramdas, invariably that we say a vipassana or mindfulness and loving kindness, which we learned together in 10 day retreats in India in the old days under Goenkaji and other teachers, as mentioned. And the basic teachings of Buddha, which is that, and of course, this is something to question or find out for yourself if it's not true, that everything, we're all conditioned things, are impermanent. Because they're impermanent, they're unreliable or laden with dissatisfactoriness or suffering in the long term. And because impermanent and interconnected, there's no separate permanent self. So impermanence, dissatisfactoriness, and no separate self or interdependence are the three characteristics taught by Buddha to help free us from clinging to things that can't satisfy us in the long run. So we all found, and we were surprised to find, that actually impermanence and this kind of dour statement about life, suffering, uh, we, we didn't want to hear that. We were young hippies. We were looking for Zorba the Buddha, Viva la Dharma, joyful Sangha, celebrate, not celebrate, and so forth. <laughs> Did I say that or just think it? Anyway. But we, we found that through inner work and contemplative practice, including meditation, angelly, observing the impermanence in our body and mind and of course, outer world also, that it was very freeing or even happy-making to be able to relax a little bit about our worries and anxieties and control freakism because things were changing and we were not in control. And that's one of the great messages or therapies or reliefs of experiencing for oneself the truth of impermanence and transience. Not just the bad news that nothing stays, but the good news that everything is in flux and changeable and renewing and life and death and death isn't the end and life and it's a cycle, the seasons, and we can see it in ourselves. And that we are heavily conditioned, but we can also recondition and decondition because everything is changing. There's no fixed permanentness. Of course, we need to check into this ourselves. So this was a great revelation to us. And I want to emphasize that because, again, it is the main teaching of Theravada and Buddhism, especially of the mindfulness tradition that is so much um, coming to in the, popular in the West today, impermanence. The farm in Western Massachusetts from which our satsang almost sprang or landed, or from which the insight meditation centers and movements sprang, it's called impermanence farm, a Nietzsche farm. That's how important it is to all of us. But somehow... It's this, been there a long time. Yeah, now. it's been, been there for 45 years, so that's the good news. <laughs> <laughs> how old we've become, not so good news, but happy. So when Buddha says, according to Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Vietnamese Zen master, life is full, uh, uh, the unenlightened life, worldly life, Life is full of challenges, of suffering. Still, we can embrace the suffering joyfully, recognizing this too shall pass. And it's not our fault. And this too shall pass. And we can let go and let be and realize great peace, nirvanic peace, in things just as they are. Not complacence, but great peace beyond the dichotomies of noise and quiet or stillness and movement. Nirvanic peace, here and now. So that's called the three marks of existence, impermanence, dissatisfactoriness or suffering because of that great flux and change and unreliability of all things. And no separate self because all in interdependent, relational, subjective, not solid, not s fixed. Right. So many of us, then we, um, of course we're Maharaji's uh, disciples, so as I said yesterday, I'd probably be a, quite a dried up Buddhist scholar and translator. I mean, even more than I am. If it hadn't been for Maharaji opening my heart and teaching me to sing. So sing out, friends. Viva la Dharma and Jaya Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, Ram Das, you have... Uh 
seen a lot of. Uh, as it, I don't. You remember in uh, India there was a brand of cigarettes called Passing Show. <laughs> <laughs> so you you've seen a lot of that go by, and your uh, um, body has certainly gone through a lot of suffering. So I would like a ask you to uh, unpack that. Uh, sense of non-self uh, because you speak of the soul so much and that's a different uh, level of self I think that the way I understand it from you do you want to talk about soul in relation to sure. Buddhism <laughs> <laughs> I love this. <laughs> when you get old, change, change is happening. Change is your, in your memory in your body, in your family, and friends. This year, my friend, my oldest friend, Died, Stephen Levine. He was younger than me. The world is different without Stephen. The world is different, but my relationship to Stephen is the same. Stephen and I have a soul relationship. And the souls are not in time. We go on and on and on and on, and on, and on. Pass through soul planes, pass through spiritual planes, pass through incarnations in earth plane. Stephen is, is, is with me. This is because we loved one another. The love between two souls. A woman came to me. Her husband had died. She was wanting contact with her husband. And I said to her, you have work to do until you identify with your soul. Identify with your spiritual self. Then your loving thoughts will bring your husband. He is loving you as a soul. 
And she came to me a few days later. You are right. You're right. It was, it was the, the love that they had between one of the two of them. The love that's stable and unconditional. She didn't love him because he was her husband. She loved him as a fellow soul. What else do you want? Well, that <laughs> uh, should take care of this talk. <laughs> uh, part of what you said comes to seeing the identity that, uh, you know, is considered non-self from uh, uh, a deeper place within yeah. the incarnation. This soul business, it's driving me up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Driving who up the wall? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, deep down, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> Souls, what the hell are they? <laughs> a guy came up to me. Uh, he said, uh, you're a guy who talks to your talks to your dead girl, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, that's your imagination. I said, yeah. <laughs> In my previous life, I was a social scientist. And now, uh, I live in my heart. Heart cave? <laughs> <laughs> my heart and my imagination. Imagination. Uh, well, you, you talk about soul, which I'm going to get rid of for now. But huh? I'm going to get rid of soul for now. But okay, let's, let's go back to, um, just for a moment before we leave this part of it, to uh, what you often call witnessing. Yes. Witnessing the incarnation, which yes. is uh, kind of a different level than the ego self. as a social scientist? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you witness your incarnation, when you witness your mind, this is bad, bad to say, but the witness <laughs> 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 Is the soul. <laughs> this is a cute little way to get into the soul, not not the soul. <laughs> you think of a you think something that isn't going to get you to God. 
like I'm a moron, something like that, or I have my, I, I don't have love, or anything, anything like that. And you identify with your thoughts. And then identify with the other thought. I do it this way. I, I say, this feels uncomfortable. Or, I don't like this person. Something like that. I say, this feels very weird. And then, how did I get into this place? See, that's the key. How do I get into this place? And I'll, I'll go down to the witness and I'll find out. Because the witness has a perspective of past and future and culture and all that stuff. And your ego and its wants and stuff like that. I answered the question, what the hell did I do there? What am, what am I doing here? So when I get to the witness, the witnessing all of the, the perspective of all, of all. See, that thought came to, came from the soul's karma. The soul needs the, needs the ego to work out its karma. You are now working out your karma, identifying with these bodies and psychological things. And then I, I do one thing. Two, two things. I look at that thought, that miserable thought, And I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, it, it, I used to say, I love it to death. <laughs> but that didn't work because the ego the, the soul loves things. It doesn't love them to death. And then I'm in the witness. My identification is with the witness. I'm very perspective. Uh, way like that. Perspective. You know, we are, we are in this predicament, in these bodies, it's lessons, it's a lesson. I took birth in a family that was power oriented. 
everyone is power oriented. My brother was a track star and an organist that played this huge organ. That, those are two brothers. My mother, she got, she got an incarnation as a Jewish mother. And she wanted to have a family that a Jewish mother would be proud of, proud of. And she used love for her power so that I grew up not fully getting love. And, but power oriented. And then, Came, came psychedelics. Tim Leary moved in next door. And I thought that I was, my heart, my heart was something I didn't know anything about. But then I learned. And then by path leading to uh, psychedelics, Maharaji, Maharaji loved me. Didn't know, he didn't want any conditions. He loved me. He loved all the other in the in the satsang. We all got loved. And I felt what what love was all about. And my motivation changed. Power to love. And then Larry Brilliant, one of our satsang, he's a doctor in Berkeley. Or Moran, I guess. And he said, when I stood, sat right in front of Maharaji, I knew he was a saint. And I knew he would love everybody. But when I sat there, I loved everybody. It was catchy. <laughs> and I caught it from Maharaji. I loved everybody. I love everybody. It's my nature. 
the nature of my so soul. <laughs> the soul loves everybody. The soul is in my imagination. <laughs> Because I don't see it, I don't smell it, I don't taste it, I don't hear it, but I know it's there, or I am there. And that is my imagination. <laughs> you didn't, I didn't, you didn't expect that. <laughs> I don't expect any. But from the, uh, from the uh, Tibetan perspective, uh, the subtlety of what transmigrates, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, because you have all these tulkus, you know, the 17th karmapa. You're talking about rebirth. Reincarnation. Yeah. Yeah. What reincarnates? The same thing that animates us now. The stream Which is, of being. sounds suspiciously Doesn't like it? what he's talking it about. It does. <laughs> it does. This is a slippery matter. <laughs> it's a slippery matter. It's a slippery matter. <laughs> when we find, when we... Um, realize or awaken to who continues from our own birth until death will understand exactly what continues from death on. But that's the matter of awakening or enlightenment or self-realization. In this incarnation. In this incarnation. And then, as you mentioned, incarnate lamas or tulkus like the Dalai Lama that theoretically have continued on, you know, their mission lifetime to lifetime. Theoretically? They are recognized as doing so. Yeah. Then um, they can consciously direct their stream of being, just like masterful individuals among us can direct their path in life while other people just wander lost much of the time. Therefore, we work on this notion of self-realization, freedom and mastery, and understanding karmic cause and effect, and so on, so we can get our hands on the rudder of our boat, so we can get our hands on the steering wheel of our car, and not just this rear view mirror, and think that that's steering something. Well, there's this funny issue between, you know, getting your hands on the wheel and, uh, surrendering to that other level of, yes. uh, you know, what might be called the guru or the Tao or... Right. Well, um, that's a great subject. The, um, the Buddhists have a way of discussing it. There's two parts of Buddhism as we think of it. One is self-power, your own efforts, as Buddha said, work out your enlightenment with diligence. Don't depend on a higher being or someone else. And the other part is other power, where you recognize that you can't do it all and you ask, we're interrelated, you ask for help or you surrender. You do the best you can and let go also and no, whatever happens, happens. As we talked about yesterday from the Bhagavad Gita, etc. Doing your duty and not being attached to the fruits of actions. So there's a balance, as always, as I mentioned yesterday, I think Buddha's greatest teaching is the middle way, not all or nothing. So there's a balance between doing and being, effort and effortless. The Bodhisattva intention to illumine or liberate the world and relieve suffering and the great acceptance of things as they are at the same time. If our heart and mind is big enough to include the, that contradiction of doing and being, then we find peace and fulfillment every step of the way not waiting until some pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That every step of the way is the great way, not looking forward to a pot of gold later. 
we're, we're at Rhonda, the end of the rainbow. The rainbow's a circle, as you know, if seen from above, the bigger picture. No pot of gold, except in people's imagination, which is a marvelous thing that motivates us to seek to get from here to there, even though the real journey is from here to here. That, as that would be the was guru in his imagination. Yes, viva la imagination. Uh, that would be the guru in your imagination. The guru, and I imagine my, the guru was my, my imagination. And that's really something, ain't it? It works it, it, for us. It works. It works. <laughs> And he, he, he works, works like Larry. I find his presence in my life keeps my heart wide open. And oh, I love you. I love you. I, I love every one of you, every one of you, as a soul, as a soul. I just, I just, I'm, I'm a, in a sea of love. And I keep him in my imagination. And he keeps me in my soul because he mirrors my soul. Because he is a soul. When Maharaji says that about everything passes away except love of God. Yeah. Do you feel that's that same place that you're seeing souls from, that uh, Maharaji saw us from where he was? That certainly that feeling around him was that, uh, you know, you felt you were loved more than anyone had ever loved you. Yeah. And then you realize that everyone around you was feeling the same thing. That's way. he as a as a mirror of your soul. And he's a mirror for my soul. As long as I'm in my soul, I love everything. And you, 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 you follow that path. Imagine Maharaji. He's a wonderful traveling companion. When you said that about Stephen, that the tie between you is your love, the sense of that is that love transcends death. Do you want to speak about that a little further? That, that husband and wife, that's, that's the love that transcends the death. And Stephen and I, love that transcends death. It's because if you love in the soul, souls, souls don't die. Or they, got, they don't get born.
All they do is jump into an incarnation. And then jump out of it. Stephen jumped out of this incarnation. But he's still a soul. Our souls are infinite. You are infinite. You, you specifically, you are infinite. Like people around me want to celebrate my birthday. Far out. <laughs> <laughs> The birthday of my leg. <laughs> nice. 83, no, 83. My old Ford. <laughs> I'm infinite. How, how are we going to celebrate my birthday? Celebrate my birthday is deep, dive deep in the moment. In, in any moment, moment is, is, is infinite. A moment is infinite. Just this moment. Maharaji said something else about uh, love that uh, may be a good bridge here, which is that uh, all love is pure. Yeah. Which from the standpoint of the soul working itself out, working out its karma through the incarnation, um, that puts love in a kind of special category from other emotions that we all experience, like lust, greed, envy, all that stuff, fear. But love, love is a is, different. Is is not an emotion. You know, we we have the heart in the heart center. We have the heart. Boom, 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 boom. That heart. Than the emotional heart. Oh, my heart. <laughs> the emotional heart. Then we have the spiritual heart. We deal with the spiritual heart. You know, in, in emotions, you. Uh, the opposite of love is hate. Uh, that's the emotions. That's the psychology. This love, spiritual love, unconditional. It's infinite. You're infinite. See that? See it? Oh, I can't. <laughs> That's not what he said, though. What? He said all love is pure. I know. <laughs> if people make love, That love is same love. Yeah. Why don't you two, you two say anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm inhibiting what I was going to say, uh, so I won't. Um, <laughs> thank you. Bear with me. So, 
I'm a little new to this conversation. I don't know what Maharaji meant or said that all love is pure. But um, you said in response, unlike lust and anger and other emotions, meaning not pure. So I, from the tantric point of view, the Vajrayana point of view, you they're mentioned, all pure. Yeah, from the Zoch, the non-dual mystical point of view, they're all pure. Every arising is pure in the moment. We make it into a string of moments and then we get you know, the string effect, and we string ourselves up, we get, we get hung up on it, we get a chain of discursive thinking. But in the moment, anger is just an energy or an emo emotional arising, it's a bubble, a thought arises, a, a lust, whatever you said. So from, another, like, maybe Maharaji meant everything is pure. It's all love, from the bigger perspective, not just human love, like I love you, which perhaps anger doesn't look like that. But that everything is pure. And isn't that the way he moved? Isn't that how Maharaji rolls? He, he said it's all perfect. So that's what we're talking about, the great perfection beyond per, the duality of perfect and imperfect. So just calling out, there's also that side of things. The oneness. Yeah, the beyondness. The non-dual. The non-dual, the mystical. Everything is pure. True. And you are and we are and it is, uh, you know, what did Allen Ginsberg sing? Holy, 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 holy. It's all holy, holy, holy. But even that posits an unholy. So that's why we talk about the great perfection, the beyond perfect and imperfect, the dichotomies of our dualistic intellect. So that's the Maharaji that I love that can remind me like a mirror of my own true or pure nature, which is not my only, which is yours, which opens up the field, the possibility of treating everybody like that, like Dr. Larry said. The miracle wasn't just that he loved, Maharaji loved everyone. It was that I, Larry, loved everyone. Yeah. That's a real miracle when I, Jeffrey Miller, loves everyone as they are, not just because they do what I like, which is what I too learned at home. But at home with Maharaji, it, it's a big, it's the big tent. It's the big tent. Here we are. The great way. The great way. It's oh. open to those who have no preferences. <laughs> <laughs> My roommate. Four o'clock in the morning this morning, he's telling me about what we're going to talk about today. Can I exaggerate? Four o'clock. <laughs> That's not very loving. <laughs> <laughs> he was already up. <laughs> do we have time? Do you want to do questions and answers? Yeah. Do we have if, time for that? If, no. It's lunchtime. It says in the good book, love is greater than death. Amen. I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Even when we lose people, we may lose our child, our best friend, even we may die. But the fill in the blank, we're using the word love, does not die, unborn and undying, great perfection, true nature. True the nature. Luminous being, loving awareness as you call it. I call it the soul. He means the one. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for some soul food. Thank you. Thank you. Baba Ram Das. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>